mentioned I'm, I'm 70. And let's say because of your company five years from now, um, what's going to change in my world or somebody like me? Uh, what, what's, what's going to be the one thing because of what you're doing uh, that uh, wouldn't have been true back in 2024 if we're talking about 2029? I think, you know, as a clinician that has been in practice, I think, you know, there's been some uh, novel developments throughout, you know, every sort of phase of, of the evolution of medical science um, that really have disrupted. I mean, as you, if you look back to sort of the adoption of the stethoscope, um, when it came out, you know, the clinicians were sort of reluctant to participate in, in using it. Um, there was a, 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 a pattern of adoption that was prolonged. Um, uh, but we ultimately are sort of facing a crisis where new technologies need to be evolved and we have to adopt tools to be the next stethoscope to, you know, in, our, in, in the future of how we practice medicine. We're having dwindling numbers of providers. We're having an increasingly, you know, aging population. There's this growing need to become personalized and how care is delivered. Um, there's this growing need to sort of uh, manage the social divide. And so what we're doing is we're actually building predictive models that identify utilization patterns that help in sort of costing and right-sizing the cost of healthcare delivery for vulnerable populations like the older age population. Um, but we're also kind of addressing some of the clinical decline as well, um, identifying issues like falls and frailty and things that are big drivers of care outcomes that impact not only patients, but the, the caregivers that care for them. The providers that are in increasingly becoming disengaged and need to have something to, to kind of connect with. And so I feel like the, the tool in the medical black bag of the future is going to be solutions like the ones that you see here. And, uh, you know, discern is really, you know, seeking to be that right. The next step is scope in, in, in the medical black bag of clinicians. So my three part question is. Um, you know, what are you doing within your very innovative uh, spaces to put trust in and, and trust being as important to technology? Who's going to pay uh, for 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 what you're doing, and 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 where where do those uh, where where do those benefits benefits accrue, and how can you make sure that the the new technologies uh, aren't just helping you know Steve Clasco in Miami, but helping you know Mrs. Jones in in North Philadelphia that might not have access to Nora Ring and Apple Watch and the technologies that you're. Doing. So, uh, in terms of uh, you know our, our central tenants, and I'll start with the equity piece, is really uh, you know Paul Farmer said that the idea that some some lives matter less is kind of the root of, of of all that's wrong with the world, and so we really take that very seriously as we build that. Many of us are practicing clinicians, and we've identified that you know the the older age population is certainly a population that's challenged with equity issues as a whole, um, challenged with socio financial issues as a whole. Uh, but even within that community, there, there are clearly the haves and the have-nots, and sort of going in without the blinders is, is really important. Um, we understand, you know, a couple of the key pieces around data, so not all, you know, senior-aged ind individuals are uh, created equal, and um, therefore you need to create, you know, sort of a, a data model and an access that's individualized for populations. Um, you know, Dr. Clasco, you mentioned, uh, you know, Miami. Um, you know, versus Appalachia. I mean, even within cities, there's issues. Uh, you know, my family emigrated to Newark, New Jersey. Uh, they lived in an area where the life expectancy was 86 years of age, and across the the other side of the tracks, it was you know 69 years of age, right? And so, we've incorporated you know publicly and individually uh, incorporated data sets um, that really look at you know things like urbanizations, measures of uh, care access to primary and specialty care, uh -huh. mental health access. Um, social vices, et cetera, uh, that ultimately are going to drive, drive care outcomes uh, in, in, in an individualized fa fashion for, for people, even within a, a given uh, geographic cohort or even a population cohort. And I think when you start to drive access, access needs to be, um, you know, sort of um, individualized as well. So making sure that care managers and clinicians you know, are really double clicking on people that may not hit their radar is is really important in terms of delivering contextually and, and culturally competent care. I think there's a thing around, you know, social marginalization that there's some commonly sort of or conventionally held, held wisdom about who in population is, you know, socially marginalized. So I practice care in a primarily Caucasian community. My family is originally from Portugal. Um, I can tell you that prior to me, and there's not a lot of Portuguese speaking docs out there, these people received care in English and in Spanish, um, or they didn't receive care at all. So my first visits with many people were the dumping down of a lot of different things that they wish they told a lot of, a lot of different doctors beforehand. We understand that, uh, and we're really looking for sort of those, you know, outliers when it comes to, to social access as well. 
Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't only pertain to race, ethnicity, but just even, you know, social isolation, belonging, all of those things are important ways in which we build our models. I think the last thing from an equity standpoint that I want to talk about is data quality. Um, you know, we talk about the COVID pandemic and the fact that, you know, there was a disproportionate amount of black and, and brown uh, Americans that were affected by the COVID pandemic. Well, we don't do a great job of data capture of race and ethnicity, right? And so um, I think we probably even underestimated the impact on populations uh, because of the fact that even our demographic data capture is, is, isn't great. And so we have to understand that that's a blind spot and we have to address it. Um, I could tell you in some of the models that we've built uh, and some of the issues have been addressed already, things like Alzheimer's biomarkers, you can't use, you know, standard population norms for all populations, right? Um, because some biomarker levels are lower in individuals to, to begin with um, and sort of using, you know, sort of an average across population um, and not necessarily tying it into the way a patient phenotypically presents may not be appropriate. And then if you look at data, clinical data at face value, you'll see that Blacks, Latinos, and non-English speakers probably have lower incidence if you're just looking at the data at face value of things like frailty. The reality is, is that many of these people don't even present to, to healthcare centers um, because of trust in primary care, or you know, they tend to receive reactive care and tend to go into you know, more urgent care environments to receive their care. Um, and so we really need to be conscious of the veracity. So one of the V's of big data, we need to be con conscious of the veracity of data. And so we use a federated learning approach and really question model inputs, question model outputs to make sure that, you know, every population and every individual is right sized and addressed. Um, all of our, in terms of a trust standpoint, we're clinical guideline premised. Uh, we're, you know, big on making sure that there's reproducibility and that there's evidence basis and anything that comes out as an, as an output, that it's not a black box and that there's explainability. Um, I think clinicians are comfortable with probabilism. We all sort of differential diagnose in a very Bayesian manner, right? And so getting them comfortable with probabilism that's not their own is I think a bit an important piece. And so I think that explainability and that transparency is hugely important. Great. And then to, find, to kind of close on cost and, and sort of who pays for that, I think the value-based care arrangements are really important. Um, we've spent too much time in our healthcare system rewarding um, operational metrics as, al as, as, as proxies for outcomes. Um, everything that we're focused on is outcomes based, right? We want to see people get better. We want to see people have increased uh, lifespan, but we also want to see people have increased health span. And that's, that's tantamount. And that, that is accomplished by the true intent of what value based care was supposed to, supposed to set out to accomplish. What I want to, what I, it's hit me coming over from the traditional healthcare ecosystem to general catalyst that um, the humans that are involved in your team are incredibly important. Um, and you know all of you have curated because it's all your money um, uh, who you have on your team. So in three to five words, um, if you could just say you know what what defines the culture of your team that really makes it unique that will get somebody to want to invest in you. Hire for for attitude, um, have a, a mission, and empower.